Hello. In today's talk, I shall take a small diversion from the artificial intelligence stuff to show you how we can give our JavaScript programs access to images that have been displayed in web pages. This is necessary since a large part of AI involves image recognition, but it's also worth knowing for a wide variety of other techniques involving images, such as a simple painting program or steganography. Meet Bo. Bo is a golden retriever that my mother sometimes looks after, and he's very photogenic, so I've decided to use his photograph in this talk. I display the image in an HTML page using the IMG tag as normal. Note that I have given this image a name, dog, using both the ID attribute and the name attribute, as I don't know which sort of browser any viewer is going to use to get it up on the screen. The latest version of HTML, which at the time of the recording is HTML5, gives us a feature called a canvas. A canvas is like an image, except that it is confined to the computer's memory and doesn't appear on the screen. Think of it as an internal copy of a displayed image. We will get access to all those delicious pixels in Bo's image by reconstructing it on a canvas inside our JavaScript program, and then extracting the pixel data from that. Here's the basic code that does that. The variable img is made to be a copy of the image object named dog. For those unfamiliar with the document object in HTML, the first line of that code uses document.getElementById to hunt through the page for an element called dog. We have set up an image with that name, so the variable img becomes a copy of that image. GetElementById is very useful if you've got some named object tucked away somewhere, such as in a table cell and it can find it using just its defined name. Then we use the document object again to create a canvas. The createElement function built into document creates any object of the specified type and hands it over to be stored in a variable. In this case, the program is creating an element of type canvas and storing it in a variable that is also called canvas. This is where the copy of the image will be stored. The image has a certain width and height, and these have been copied to variable img when it was set up, along with the pixel data. The next two lines of code copy those dimensions to the canvas as well, so that it will have the same width and height as the image. The final line of code copies the pixel data across from image to canvas, using the function drawImage built into the canvas object. The img variable is one parameter, and we specify which part of the image we want copied with four more. In this case, we want the whole thing transferred across. So we tell it to draw, in inverted commas, the image from pixel 0 all the way across to the full width, and from the top row, row 0, all the way down to the last row, as specified by the height. We have to tell it that the context is a 2D image, as it's possible for canvases to store three-dimensional ones as well and we don't want it doing anything fancy. At this point, we now have a variable called canvas that is basically a clone of our image. Here's the line of code that extracts a single pixel from that image. We assume that the pixel you want has the coordinates x columns along and y rows down. Remember, the zero point of the image is the top left corner, so the pixel at the top left has x value 0 and y value 0. The getImageData function takes these values of x and y, and in this case, returns a single pixel, which we store in a variable also called pixel. In fact, pixel is not a single number. It's an array of four whole numbers, each in the range 0 to 255 inclusive. You'll recall that all the pixels on a computer screen are formed by blending a red component, a green component, and a blue component. The first element contains the value of the red component at that pixel, where 0 means no red at all, and 255 means the red is saturated at that point. A value of 255 doesn't necessarily mean that the pixel will appear red, of course, only that the red component is as fully on as it can be. For instance, a pixel with all the colour components set to 255 actually appears white. Similarly, the next two elements contain the green and blue components of the pixel, and the final value is the alpha component. 
This isn't something I shall mention again in this tutorial, as it doesn't really concern us here, but it's basically a measure of transparency. An alpha value of 255 means that the pixel of the image is fully opaque, with the transparency increasing as the alpha value drops below 255. So, here's that lot put together in a sample program. I've had to squash everything up and put a few commands on the same line in order to fit everything in, but it should still be legible. There are one or two things which are worth mentioning here. Firstly, note that Bo's image has had an on-click attribute added. This is so that when you click the mouse on the image, the function report pixel is called, and the program will report the color of the pixel that you just clicked on. The parameter event is filled in by the JavaScript program itself, and contains the data of where the mouse was when the button was clicked. Of course, this function will only be called when you click on the image, as the function is tied to that image. Clicking anywhere else on the screen won't have any effect. Well, no effect on our program, that is. The call to the getImageData function of our canvas object takes place in report pixel. In this case, the x and y coordinates of the pixel are read in from the mouse position in the event properties offset x and offset y. Once the pixel has been extracted, a simple alert command is used to display the red, green and blue values on the screen. You can easily adapt this if you want to display the alpha value as well. An important point to note is that the code setting up the canvas is called using the onload property of the body tag. This is deliberate and doing it any other way might cause the program to malfunction. Here's why. The onload property only fires up when everything else on the page has been displayed and the page is fully constructed. It is always the last thing to be run. Now it is so tempting to write the code like this. Here's the same thing, but I have simply run the code to set up the image straight away, without messing around with that onload command. The problem is that the code will run and attempt to collect the image data almost certainly before the image has appeared on the screen. It will appear to work, but it will be collecting null data from an undisplayed image. And wherever you click on that image, when it does appear, the program will simply tell you that all three components of that pixel are zero. Stick to onload to make sure that everything is settled down before the JavaScript attempts to copy the image data. Going back to the correct version, notice too that the variable canvas is a global one. You need to access it inside the report pixel function, so it must be declared in the main body of the JavaScript. There is no word var next to the canvas variable in function setup image. Here's what it looks like in Firefox, which is the browser I generally use. Firefox generally darkens the screen when an alert box is displayed, which is why Bow appears in deep shadow, and my screen grab facility doesn't indicate where the mouse is, so I've had to place a red circle to show roughly where I click the mouse. As you can see, it was near the top left corner, as indicated by the coordinates 7, 7, and the values of 34, 21 and 30 are very low, so the pixel is quite dark. Here I have added two more attributes to Bo's image, specifying the width and height of the image at 100. This is reflected in the canvas, and it will only report on pixels that are in the range 0 to 99 for both the column and the row. It might seem a little cruel to shrink Bo down and distort him into a square, but it will prove useful when we come to extracting large numbers of pixels. Of course, there is no reason why you should be limited to only one image. Here, Bo is joined by a lovely little kitten. Ah, isn't it sweet? And the program is adapted to report the pixel data for both images. Bo's image is still called dog, and the new kitten's image is called kitten. We still use onload in the body tag to set up the image data, but the function report pixel has had to be adapted so that it can refer to either the dog picture or the kitten picture, depending on which image was clicked. The variables dog pick and kitten pick are our two canvases, and replace the single variable canvas in the previous example. You see the two canvases declared as global variables at the start of the JavaScript, and the code inside setup image has been duplicated for both dog and kitten. The variable picture was our variable img in the previous example. It can be totally local to setup image, as when the canvases have been created, 
we don't need variable picture anymore. Indeed, you see the same variable can be used for the dog and then reused for the kitten. The function report pixel has an extra parameter, pic, which tells it which canvas to examine. This only appears in the line that extracts the pixel itself, calling the get image data function from the pic parameter, which will either be dog pic or kitten pic. The result is that we now have two images, which the program treats independently, each with their own independent coordinate systems. Clicking on the centre of Bo's nose gives this result, while clicking on the centre of the kitten's nose gives this result. You'll agree that the setup image function looks very bloated and contains a great deal of repetition. This could be streamlined as follows. This is sleeker. In this case, setup image only contains two calls to the function setup picture, which sets up each image. The canvas object this time is local to setup picture because it is handed back when the function ends and the result stored firstly in dog pick and then in kitten pick. And finally, we come to a program with a bit of substance to it. You'll see the image of Bo squashed down to 100 pixels in both directions. We've booted the kitten. And below that is a series of buttons so we can extract various bits of information from the image. The square on the right is actually a table consisting of 100 by 100 squares. You can't see them, but every square is 3 pixels by 3 pixels and coloured white. These will change as we do various things. I painstakingly created a series of squares using paint, each with a red, green and blue set to the same value. This gives a sequence of grey squares, ranging from jet black, when the red, green and blue are all set to zero, to snow white when they are all set to 255. Rather than having to create 256 of these squares with every single number in that range, I created them in steps of five, and you can see them listed here, and enlarged for the screen, going 0, 5, 10, 15 and so on. This way I only needed 51 images. To save myself the bother of having to create a table of a hundred rows, each of which having a hundred columns by hand, I did it using a small section of JavaScript embedded directly between the opening and closing table tags. In fact, what you see is a table within a table. The outer table has the border set to a thin black line, so that a border appears around the working area. The inner table contains all those squares, each named with the letter R, and the row and column numbers, separated by an underscore. This is so that we can change the colours of those squares as the programme runs. The essential part of the code should be fairly familiar by now. Now you can see why we squashed bow down to 100 pixels by 100 pixels. This will make the running times of the programme a bit more manageable. Even so, I should warn you, it does take quite a long time to run. The canvas variable is going to be called internal this time round, and I have also defined three more global arrays to hold the red, green and blue components of each of the pixels. I have removed the feature where you click on the image to get the component values at that point. Instead, those components for all the pixels are read in and stored, and that can be done in function setup image. I won't waste your time by going through the first few lines. You've seen them often enough in this tutorial to know what they do by now. I will point out that I cheated slightly in order to fit the whole function on one slide, and used fixed values of 100 rather than the picture width and height read from the image itself. After all, we already know that the image is 100 pixels wide and 100 pixels high. However, after that, the function contains a double loop. It goes through every row, and for each one, it sets the array elements for the red, green and blue components to an array. This is the standard way of making an array two-dimensional. For each row, it then goes along the columns, reading the pixel data using the get image data function and storing them in the arrays. For each pixel array returned, the red component is element 0, the green component is element 1, and the blue component is element 2. The buttons on the left side of the screen, under Bose Portrait, all call the function show with a different parameter. The parameter for the first button is 0 meaning only show the red component. The parameter for the second button is 1, meaning only show the green component, and so on. I have also created three buttons which construct a monochrome image 
from the three different pixel components. The internet tells me that there are three common ways of doing this, and I have included them all here. The first part of the function is given here. The entire function consists of two nested for loops which go through each pixel on each row. Firstly, a switch statement selects the components needed depending on which button was clicked and writes them into a variable called x. x will be used to determine what colour to set any square on the screen. The values of the red, green and blue components are read from the two dimensional arrays into variables r, g and b, simply for convenience. For the first three options, it's easy. If the show red button was clicked, x becomes the red component, i.e. variable r. If the show green button was clicked, x becomes g for the green component, and it becomes b for the blue component on clicking the show blue button. It's a little harder for the three monochrome options. Here we need to turn the three pixel values into one grayscale value. The first way of doing this, when the show parameter is 3, is simply to take the arithmetic mean and store it in x. Note that I round it to the nearest integer by adding 0.5 and taking the floor value of the result, i.e. the largest whole number less than the result after the 0.5 has been added. This is a standard way of rounding. The lightness method is similar, but here it's a straight arithmetic mean of the largest of the three pixel components and the smallest of the components. The largest value of r, g and b is stored in max, and the smallest is stored in min, and a mean value is calculated and rounded to a whole number. The luminosity method uses the fact that human eyes are, supposedly, more sensitive to the colour green. It therefore uses a weighted average, including more of the green component, less of the red, and considerably less of the blue. The result is then rounded. Finally, the value of x must be used to select a shade of grey. x is a whole number in the range 0 to 255 inclusive, but, thanks to my laziness, we only have images for every multiple of 5. The first thing that happens is that x is reduced to a multiple of 5, if it isn't already. That's what that while loop is about. And then finally, the document object is used to set the image of that square on the screen to the picture corresponding to x. Low values of x will produce a dark image, high values a light one. So, let's see what all that produces when processing the image of bow. Here I have clicked on the show red button, and the box on the screen indicates the strength of the red component of the pixels at each point in the image. That's actually not a bad representation of bow, certainly recognisable. The reason is that bow, being golden in colour, is essentially a mixture of red and green pixel components, since they make yellow when combined. The pixels that aren't golden in the photograph are generally dark, and appear so in the box. This explains why the result for showing green is similar. All the golden pixels that contain a high degree of red also contain a high degree of green. However, the same can't be said of the blue component. This is considerably lower across the entire range, and so the result is much darker. I've put the results of the monochrome rendering side by side so that you can make a comparison. The straight average is on the left. The lightness method, i.e. the average of the minimum and maximum components of each pixel, in the middle, and the luminosity method, which emphasises the green, on the right-hand side. What do you reckon? Does any of them strike you as being more convincing than the other two? I'd be interested to hear your opinions in the comments. And there you have it. How to read image data into a JavaScript program. On my website, I've included the code for each of the configurations that I have shown you today, for you to experiment with. I've even included a photograph of Bo, although I think you'll prefer to see what you can do with your own images. In the next tutorial, I'm putting this to good use as we make a start on climbing the mountain that is image recognition.